I kind of laughed about today's devotional because that um, it's got an interesting twist on it that I found an answer that I think maybe Tozer didn't kind of grasp in his life or get a chance to completely explain what he meant because he is after all Tozer I mean he saw things he talked about things he dealt with things that were a reality in his life. He was known to be the writer and the person who was able to minister in his denomination to hundreds of people in a lot of the subject matter that he was dealing with that was very challenging to him. He saw things that the people didn't realize themselves, that they weren't able to deal with, and he would look as an overview upon the entire Christian world, and he would say, we need to be careful of this. We need to be aware of how this is happening. And as an editor and as a writer, he was given that opportunity because he was able to see all the news stories coming in and all the things that was going on in society. And so as he had grown in his faith in, I think he was in Christian missionary office. I think that's where he originally had come from and been taught. So he was in that framework. But in that denomination that he was in, he saw and ministered to such a degree that his works suddenly took on a greater meaning. They suddenly weren't dealing with just pastors in his own denomination or his own outreach within the readership of his magazine, but people began to say, that's happening in my church, that's happening in my area or sphere of influence, that's beginning to fit for me. And often that's what God does. Sometimes you'll see something that's true to your own little world, you know, your your circle, so to speak. You know, in Google we have this, this typical terminology in Google Plus, we call it a circle. And what you do is you have your friends that you put in your circle and you have this little sphere of influence that you, when you do something, you automatically post it to all those people that are in that circle. And that's what we call a sphere of influence. A lot of times in, in our modern world, we call it six degrees of separation, or we call it the, the networking of the macro affectations of influence and they call it the affluent environmental culture one with which we're able to coordinate information to people in such a socialized way that we call it social media and we have lots of tools and venues that have been developed either through marketing or sales or information dissemination to get that out to people and in Christianity, the same thing is true. I mean, it happens by way of a variety of means, but it still works with the same principles inside of the Christian world. And so, with Tozer, it was amazing for him to have started off in such a small degree to be t considered one of the premier writers of the 20th century. And what's interesting is that he not only is accepted as that, a lot of things that he said about himself as being a prophet was accepted. And I know in evangelical circles, most people would say, well, of course, because they're used to dealing with people that claim to be prophets or use the name prophet in some way. But he was accepted in all of Christendom as being maybe not a prophet, as he said, because people won't comment on that part sometimes. But his works, being that they accept that, means they accept the body of his belief system. Sometimes that's challenging for them, I know, because Tozer was dealing with a lot in his world that affects our life right now because he was alive at our times. But in that, I see a joy of what I've learned from it is that he was very much inspired by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit as it was breaking out of the hardcore, strong, pillared, very sacramental church. And when I say sacramental church, I mean, there is such an organization in such every minutiae of what you do in a service that examples being the Catholic Church, the Greek Orthodox, any of the missile type church that has a very regimented format, even Lutheran, that they present 
the entire service as happening right in order. One thing right after another. Jewish Orthodoxy is the same way. You know exactly what you're going to do. You open up your little, you know, prayer, prayer book, you know, and you're praying, you know, and you're kind of davening, you know, and you're lifting left and right, you know, and you got a little bit of freedom, but not much. <laughs> Believe me. You know, and you do this and you do that, and then you get a chance to read Torah, you know, and you get a commentary, and you're out of there. You know, three hours later. <laughs> so, in that regimentation, he was talking about, as we're going to read, how that is not always good. But then he also is going to mention how the opposite, where you get total Pentecostalism to be no organization at all, is chaos and madness. And we see that a lot in examples of when Vineyard had broken off of Calvary Chapels and had gone their own direction, which was good. They were doing phenomenal work and ministering to people and their music was reaching the heights of the heavens and people were getting involved in their ministry and they were Oh, so excited and thrilled. And then came this whole new thing, the Toronto experience. And then down in the state side, I can't even remember where it was called nowadays, but it was this whole barking idea and this slain in the spirit, knock down, drag out, you know, rolling around on the ground, you know, foaming at the mouth kind of thing. Well, no, you don't need that kind of chaos. I mean, if you're into that, go watch, go be, go become a part of it. But Tozer would be against that because it would be disorganized rather than organized. And somewhere in between there's a balance, you know, where God has given us the sun to rise and then it sets and then it goes down. And then the moon to rise and then it comes up and then it goes down. And there's a sunlight, and there's a darkness, and there's moonlight, and then there's sunlight, and there's a day with stars in the night, and then there's a night with the sun being far removed on the opposite side of the world, for there always is that going on within 24 hours. So likewise, in the body of Christ, there's always things going on in the process of development and changing, that there's some organization behind it all that God is bringing his bride to prepare herself for the day that she's brought out of the world. But we, as we study and learn and apply it to our lives, each one of us individually have a certain amount of chaos that we could just say, oh, I'll do it whenever I feel like it. Or we have a certain amount of structure when we go, you know, I really need to get some sleep once in a while. We organize our lives accordingly, is that if you are a night sleeper, you know, and you sleep at night, then you obviously do your work in the day. But if you're a day sleeper, then you obviously do your work at night. So you coordinate those things you want to accomplish according to that, where you're at and what you do and what you are good at. In other words, if my job required me to work graveyard shift, then obviously I would sleep in the daytime. If my job required me to work during the daytime, then obviously I would sleep at night. Those are certain parameters, outlines that we would do within our normal work week. In Christianity, the same is true. If you are a person who lives by grace and you know the mercy and the love of God that has been shed abroad, then you're probably going to be used to a variety of windows and opportunities of the entire body of Christ so that you could share the love that's been shed broadly amongst us all. But if you're segmented and you're very regimented into a certain format that you can only see and be and participate in, then obviously you're not going to be used in the greater body of Christ. And why are you trying to make and put that kind of structure on top of somebody who isn't structured? In other words, you don't go out and tell someone who's working graveyard to sleep at night. You don't say, well, thus saith the Lord, God said that this is night and you shall sleep. So if you got a job at graveyard, you know, you have to sleep while you're on your job. That just doesn't make sense now, does it? Of course not. So common sense or some type of practical reality has to be a part of your faith, not just a part of your life. See, that's where Christians make the big mistake. They don't look at what they're saying because it's faith, after all, and put practical 
nuts and bolts to it that's common sense or intelligent faith. Intelligent faith knows that you put structure and unstructured and blessing and joy and wisdom all together in the volume of the book that it is written that gives us all the answers to how we express ourselves, whether in structured, completely, unstructured, mostly, or whether we find the balance between the two so that we would be likened unto Jesus, who gave us a certain amount of structure and a lot of freedom and grace and mercy to apply as God leads us. Because what may be good for me, working graveyard, may not be good for you working day shift. Or what's good for me in day shift won't be good for you in working graveyard. Or for those that aren't working, neither one works. <laughs> Let us not substitute organization for life. For this cause I left you in Crete, that thou should set in order the things that are wanting and ordain elders in every city as I had appointed them, Titus 1.5. I have been for years much distressed about the tendency to over-organize the Christian community, and I have for that reason had it charged against me that I do not believe in organization. The truth is quite otherwise. A certain amount of organization is necessary everywhere throughout the created universe and in all of human society. Without it, there could be no science, no government, no family unit, no art, no music, no literature, no creative activity of any kind. The man who would oppose all organization in the church must needs be ignorant of the facts of life. Art is organized beauty. Music is organized sound. Philosophy is organized thought. Science is organized knowledge. Government is merely socialized, social, <laughs> Government is merely society organized. And what is true of the Church of Christ but organized misery, mystery? Boy, reread those words when I got the reading glasses on. The throbbing heart of the church is life. In the happy phrase of Henry Skogel, the life of God in the soul of man is what the church is. This life, together with the actual presence of Jesus within her, constitutes the church a divine thing a mystery and a miracle. Yet without substance and form and order, this divine life would have no dwelling place and no way to express itself to the community. There must be some type of structure. There is no real danger in the efforts of some to do substitute organization for life so that they may have a name to live they are spiritually dead. In other words, sometimes people will use organization to hide the realization of people around them that they're so organized they're going through the motions and there's no life in them. So in that we can put on the phoniness of being oh you know I just whenever the Lord leads me I feel like praying. Whenever the Lord leads me I feel like doing. Whenever the Lord leads me I feel like speaking. Whenever the Lord leads me then I'll go witness. Whenever the Lord leads me, then I'll go to church. Whenever I get the feeling of the presence of God, then I'll read my Bible. Whenever I feel like it, I'll do it. That's not freedom. That's deception. It is a fallacy. And fallacy means a way of looking at things that hides a fact in a volume of phony ideas, of fallacious thoughts, of false thoughts, fallacy. You know, it fails the accurate definition of fact and truth. Facts you can put together to come to the conclusion of truth. Fallacy you never can. It is always hiding from the realization of the facts and is trying to disguise the conclusion that the fallacy presents. So, whenever a person tells you that they don't feel like, or they haven't been led to do something, they're just lying. It's just their covering of trying to hide from God himself speaking to them. So they take their own words and use them as kind of a fig leaves to cover their own sinfulness. 
The same thing is true of the person who goes through the motions every week of automatically, got to go to church, i got to go to church, i got to go to church. They get up, they run, they go, they do, they're Sunday school, you know, they're there Sunday morning, they're there, and they get up and they do it and they meet it and they're consistent every week. And they sit there. And they don't necessarily hear from God. And they don't necessarily talk to God. But they go through the motions. They're doing their duty. They've done the things that he said. They've opened up their home to strangers. They've gone through giving and donating and being a part of a ministry in writing the check. They've given that few minutes of time that they're supposed to do to pray in repeating grace and saying grace over meals and praying at night to saying, oh yes, let us pray. But going through the motions is not going through the knowledge of the realization of Jesus Christ. It's not through the personal relationship of the dynamic, ongoing realization of what God would ask you to do or to say. It is not actually participating with Jesus in those circumstances he brought to you and said, now, let me show you what to do, where to go, and what to say. It's not actually trusting in the Lord. It's trusting in the regiment. It's being dogmatic, which is where we get the word dogma, which is the invention of rules and regulations to require a person to do something in a religious way to accomplish some quote-unquote idea of a relationship without there being that personal dynamic of the interaction together. Orthodoxy in Judaism is full of it. It has a whole rigmarole and rigmarole of going through the motions without ever having the reality of God in them. And in doing that, then the failure of what the person does is that they no longer have that personal relationship and response from God, but they do have a very personal and religious feeling of what they're doing is right. And they're very adamant about being righteous about it and being right in doing it without ever hearing from God himself.